Hello and welcome to Micro Live. This week we'll be taking a long look at a university in the United States which is planning to have more computers than students. In an open letter to British students, Mrs Thatcher describes information technology as a challenging opportunity. If we seize it, we can compete in the markets of the world, create new jobs and increase our prosperity. If we fail, Britain can only slip back. But academics believe the government is ducking its responsibility while merely paying lip service to information technology. They believe that current policy, as outlined in the recent Green Paper, will result in a 30% cut in student numbers by 1995. Although most of these will be in the arts, cuts of this magnitude would inevitably include science and technology. Last night in the Rank Xerox annual lecture, Professor John Ashworth, the Vice-Chancellor of Salford University, called, if anything, for an expansion of university places, if we are to meet the skill shortage which some people are putting as high as 50%. More from Professor Ashworth later in the programme. As the funding from government grants decreases, the universities are being forced to search for other sources of money. One possible source, of course, is industry. But here in Britain, companies see no tax benefits. As one British computer manufacturer told MicroLive, business should be profitable. Giving away kit to universities is just a way of losing money. But is it? In America, as we'll see, the big computer manufacturers are pouring money into education. Not only do they enjoy substantial tax advantages, they see the long-term benefits to their own industry. This is Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Not too long ago, it was just a local technical college with a good liberal arts program. In fact, most of the cast of Hill Street Blues are alumni of the theater department. But for the last two decades, it's been driven by technology. They claim that they had the first official computer sciences department in the entire world. They have three times as many VAXs as there are classrooms on the campus, and a VAX is a computer that can cost about a half a million dollars by the time you're done buying it. And lastly, they're involved right now in an incredibly ambitious networking project, tying together the entire campus. Most of the schools in America are watching it with great eagerness. Carnegie Mellon is a private university. It survives by raising money from fees, investments, and outside sources. It's now one of the leading centers in the United States for work on high technology. Recently, it's raised over $150 million for its work on robotics and artificial intelligence. One specialty is robot vehicles that can find their way around on their own. Another is work on new memory devices which are read by lasers. Carnegie Mellon, or CMU as it's known, offers the normal range of subjects you'd find at any American university, though in many of these, there's a bias towards using computers. The university has a reputation for asking for hard work, hard play, and high fees. $11,000 a year in tuition and housing buys you the chance of a place in America's technological future. You'd expect to find computers in the laboratories, but here at CMU, you'll find them not only there, but everywhere on campus. A student population of about 6,000 has access to 4,000 terminals and personal workstations. They call this place the Apple Orchard because it's filled with Apple Macintosh machines, which anyone can come to use at any time, and for virtually any purpose, from writing class assignments to producing advertisements for rooms to let. The room is always crowded, and not just with technology students. And one of the things that we see on this campus already, and I'm sure we'll see lots more of it, is an enormous amount of computer sophistication among just plain folks. Uh, English students, history professors, we have a history professor who teaches uh, a whole course in the use of computers in history. Um, not too many campuses can be doing that. I mean, he really knows his computers. And many of our students do too. Students who come here are expected to master computing techniques quickly. All are required to learn to use a word processor. And even art students, studying, say, English or drama or history, have to take a one-semester course in a computer language, either basic or Pascal. And so the university makes computers available even in the residential areas. Amongst these shops and right next door to the laundromat, there's what they call a computer cluster. It's almost like a library, only instead of borrowing books, you borrow software. Hi, Jane. Hi. Can I have Epsilon? And, uh, I need a Micron boot up. 
Okay, years. thanks. Some of the software you can borrow here links you to a traditional time-sharing system. This means individuals share time on a mainframe computer somewhere else on the campus. Andrew is majoring in chemical engineering. Right, it's connected to what we call the top system, which is short for time-sharing operating system, and that is a DEX system 20, and that's linked up to mainframe computers. Okay. Now, what would you use it for? Well, uh, from anything trivial, like uh, checking your mail or sending mail back and forth, or finding out who's on the system, or uh, running a, a program, getting in an editor, creating an outline, doing word processing. Doing like your that. papers, doing your Doing homework. your papers, right. Mm -hmm. But there also is coursework such that um, professors can, can assign something, and you can get into their directory, and you can use the software that they've made available through this, through this system. Tossed the jargon around pretty freely. Were you using computers before you came to Carnegie Mellon? Uh, no, I wasn't. As a matter of fact, I came from a, a small public high school, and uh, at that time, you know, four years ago, uh, our particular high school had not had any programs in computers. So, you know, I had never had any uh, terminal time, as they say, before I was here. Now, you're not an engineering student. No, I'm a humanities major. I'm oh. a history and writing major. Okay. And you dealt with computers at all before coming to Carnegie Mellon? Nope, not at all. And how have you found it? Well, at first, I didn't like it at all. I had to take a programming course that was very difficult. Here at Carnegie Mellon, you've reversed a fairly long-standing tradition of making technical students take English courses by making liberal arts students take basic computer courses, but not simple ones, things like Pascal, and Lisp, high-level languages. Do you get any resentment from liberal arts students who didn't come here for that? They make a choice to come to this university in part because we do expect technical problem-solving skills from the liberal arts students. And so I would say four years ago, there was more resentment on the part of the liberal arts students than you would see today. Today, almost all of our students realize, realize the benefits of the kinds of technical training that they can receive here. And even the liberal arts courses are using computer programs as educational tools. Oh, surely. To help students learn the programming language called LISP, the university has developed an impressive expert system which diagnoses your mistakes and helps you understand what to do next. It's 30% faster and produces 40% higher marks than using textbooks, lectures, and tutorials. Impressive results. But does this kind of computer-based learning isolate the students? How many hours a week would you say you spend here in front of a machine or another machine? A lot. Um, depending on what week it is, like anywhere up to 20 or 30. Or... 20 or 30 hours a week in front of the... Yeah. Not what you expected when you came to college, right? No. Uh -huh. There's, I think, a fear and a stereotype that if a student is working at a machine, the student is isolated from other people and uh, absorbed in the technology. This need not be the case. We're discovering that students who may be spending hours at a computer terminal are spending some of those hours talking with other students via electronic mail or via bulletin boards. Electronic mail is one of the success stories of the university. If you look in the campus phone book, nearly everyone has an electronic mail address, which has led to some strange new patterns of behavior. For example, when I'm working on the computer at 2 in the morning, if students see that I'm working on the computer, they'll send me mail and say, I have a problem with this problem set. Can you help me with it? No student would ever call a professor at 2 in the morning. Of all the software programs online around the campus, the two most often used are trivial though very human. Well, finger is just a, a simple thing that you type in to uh, find somebody else who's working on the mainframe along with you. You can find what terminal work they're working at. It'll give you the location of the terminal and also, other uh, information. Also tells you a lot of other information if you feel like putting it on your file to be picked yeah, up. Yeah, you, like you can have a plan file that, that you make yourself that says whatever you want to about yourself. So when somebody fingers you, they can, they can read it. Leave your phone number. Your right, preferences, that's, that's what I like do. Sailing, it's, uh... That's what I do. In other other places, I can be found. Ah, cookie. Yes. Well, um, should we try it and see what we get? Fine by me. Okay. I just typed cookie, and I get the attacker must vanquish. The defender need only survive. Cookie's a cute little program that <laughs> sort of gives you a. Uh, Something like a fortune cookie message. It gives you um, a riddle or a wise saying for the day or something like that. Find this useful at all? It brightens things up whenever you're sitting here all day. But don't get the wrong idea. 
At CMU, the printed word is still the most important source of information. And at the library, they've just replaced the old system for finding the books you want. This is the quotes card, unquotes catalog at CMU's library. For example, if I type BBC, it tells me there's 16 titles with that keyword in them. Let's uh, find out what they are. Well, we've got six series, two publishers, two corporate stroke conference names, and six titles. We'll go for the series to see what we've got. You've got the BBC Engineering Training Manuals, Music Guides, and the Wreath Lectures. This is incredibly fast how, how it's coming up. Six. And the Wreath Lectures, it tells me they've got Alfred Charles Bernard Lovell, the individual, and the universe. Well, that's the first stage. The next stage comes later this year when they install barcode readers. All the books have barcodes on them. When the barcode readers are in place, when you check out a book, it will be read. And when you check the database, it will tell you not only whether the book is in the collection, but whether it's in the library or whether someone else has got it right now. At present, you can only use this system if you're physically in the library. But when the university's ambitious plans are complete, this will be one of a number of facilities you should be able to reach from anywhere on campus, even from your own room. The new network being developed is far more ambitious than anything we've seen so far. The university and IBM have a joint project to develop an advanced workstation. IBM has already poured in $20 million, some of which helped fund this computer science building. In anticipation, all the buildings on the campus are now wired up with fiber optic data cable. Only this will be enough to handle the enormous amounts of data expected to flow in the future. This is a prototype of the kind of workstation that will be installed all over campus when the network is completed. The basic concept behind the workstation is the three big M's. A MIP, a megabyte, and a megapixel. Now that means that it will be processing a million instructions per second, that it'll have a megabyte of memory on board, and that the screen will be a grid of 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, or one million bitmapped pixels on the screen. So obviously, it will be very large. Andrew is the name of the software that's being developed here at Carnegie Mellon for the interface. Now, of course, it's named Andrew because Andrew Carnegie and Andrew Mellon founded the university. It's based on the work done at Xerox PARC, pioneering work in icons, windows that you can change the size and positioning of, which have been implemented so well on the Apple Macintosh. Let me show you. Here's an example of multiple windowing and icons. We've got two windows on the screen right now and a bunch of little icons for utility programs. Let's call up the clock by tapping the activating button. It says clock to tell you what it is. All right, one of the interesting things about Andrew is the fact that the windowing software is intelligent. It rearranges the information in it so it takes best advantage of the available space. For example, the clock just got much, much larger. But if we take it down to a little smaller than it originally was, it's not an analog clock anymore at all. It's a digital clock because the analog would be too small to be readable. From Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams' Don't Panic is the icon used for the help program. All right, now we're going to call up a sample educational program that was devised here. Now we want to take a look at something called optics. So you find it by moving the line down until you see optics. There we go. Turn that on. We're going to run the sample, which will come up in yet another window. And everything on the screen will automatically rearrange itself to accommodate. Grab a lens, put it there. Grab another lens and put it there. Let's put an aperture between them. And a mirror to top it all off right there. And then finally, let's send a beam of light from here through all of this. From the axis or just off the axis, here's what happens. And all in all, gives you a kind of a workbench approach to your optics. This is not a time-sharing system. That's right. In fact, it's very different from a time-sharing system. Uh, as anyone who's ever used a time-sharing system knows, they get very, very slow when lots of people want to use them. They've also become quite econ uneconomical with all the new chip technology. So what we have here is a lot of individual use machines, which means when you're working, you're working on the machine and you're the only one using it. 
Now, lots of what we call personal computers are things that you have at home on your desk, and that's it. Ordinarily, it doesn't communicate with any other machine. And that's also not what we're talking about here. There's a great deal of effort being put into wiring the whole campus so that although the cycles, the processing power, are in your own machine on your desk, you can get file access from a general files um, storage service. And what that means is that if I'm a professor and I have a program and I suddenly want to update it, make it a little different, I simply change that file once and my students with their own machines all over the campus have that single updated file. Uh, we are shooting for a workstation that we can sell uh, to our faculty and students uh, as individuals for about $3,000. Now, basically you're talking a machine for a workstation that for the same cost as your standard business personal computer or home computer these days, it's about 10 to 20 times more powerful. That's exactly right. If not more. Yes. Do you think they can do it? I think, I know they can do it. When the network's in place and Andrew's up and all the workstations are in, how many computers are there actually going to be on campus? Uh, we will have five to 7,000 of these advanced function workstations. Students are already encouraged to own their own micros and the university's computer shop is doing a roaring trade in today's technology, largely selling hardware and software for a range of incompatible machines. The university wants to be able to run any software on any workstation built to their specifications by any manufacturer. Is this pipe dream likely to come true? I don't know. That's, um, that's really a question for the next 10 years. It is certainly impossible with machines smaller than the ones we're talking about. If we talk about 8 or 16-bit machines, app, in this country, Apples, IBM PCs, Macintoshes, uh, the, there is no question about it. The hardware intrudes on the programming always. You have to know what kind of display device you've got, how much memory you've got, etc., etc., what sort of operating system you have. When you get a more powerful machine, you can use part of that power to provide some insulation, kind of a buffer, so that the machine says, yeah, I've got this kind of hardware, but I want to talk to the user in this way. And a very similar system can say, well, I've got a different kind of hardware, but I want to talk to the user in this way. If that's done well, and if it's done consistently, there's at least a possibility of, of what you've heard we're trying to do here, which is to have if not machine-independent software, at least software that can go with some ease from machine to machine. Meanwhile, software is being written for today's machines. This student took months to develop a program that plots the electrical field around metal objects. So an example of a thing a person can do with this program is to come over here and select graph, draw a line between two points, specify a number of points to be evaluated along that line. The program will step through and evaluate the potential along the line, and then will produce a plot of the potential as a function of position. So the student can experiment with lines, the nature of the potential variation along those lines, and the relationship of that kind of description to a plot of equal potential lines. This software was developed for this room full of Hewlett Packards you've got here. Right. What's involved in adapting it so it will run on the Andrew system when it's, it's finished? Uh, we're not sure. Um, we think it'll probably take a month or so's effort this summer to at least get a, an elementary version of it up and running on Andrew. We pay those students during the summer to do software programming for us. Obviously, this software is of great value to this university and is potentially saleable to other schools around the world. Is there any controversy about who owns it? Certainly a student who's been involved in developing software like this has some part of the rights to that software. And the question is how much of the rights belong to the university, how much belong to the individuals. The new network is inspiring many on the campus. In the music department, Roger Dannenberg has ambitious plans for the advanced workstation. Well, that was Round Midnight by Thelonious Monk. I was playing trumpet, and my computer was playing an accompanying bass line. The computer was actually listening to what I was playing, and by comparing what I played to what was stored in the computer for the melody of Round Midnight, it was able to speed up and slow down with me and play the corresponding bass line. 
what we've just done is very interesting, but how's it going to fit into the, uh, the CMU net when it's all together? Well, this is probably going to be just one component of uh, a much larger system called the Musician's Workbench. The Musician's Workbench is a, will be a collection of programs for manipulating musical information, uh, dealing with performance, allowing composers to compose music and orchestrators to orchestrate music. And this is all being uh, constructed on top of the uh, CMU workstation and the Andrew software system. So from any workstation on campus, I could call up your musical programs and use them for my composing and scoring and orchestrating, just as if I were calling up word processing or electronic mail or one of the more standard packages. That's right. You can think of our the basic level of our software as being something like a word processor for music. You've got something connected to an English synthesizer, I understand. That's right. We're using the Bradford Musical Instrument Simulator that was designed and uh, first constructed by Peter Comerford at the University of Bradford. I think eventually we'll have one of these on every musician uh, personal computer. Impressive. Now let's let's hear this. Huge sums are going into the development of computer networks here at CMU. Much of that money is coming from the computer industry. Clearly, both sides see the potential for enormous payoffs. But what are they? People in universities, professors and administrators in other universities, are, are very interested in the question of teaching and learning. People in corporations are interested in the question of what will students today who will be the employees of tomorrow expect by way of a computing environment. Um, what will they know how to do? What kinds of technology will they want in order to do the, the kinds of jobs that they've been trained to do? And obviously vendor developers and vendors of computing hardware and software are watching to see the kinds of developments that we are able to produce here. So I think many people in the world are watching for, for many different reasons. And watching from a great distance are the British universities. This is the University of Salford, a technological university similar in size to Carnegie Mellon. However, like other British universities, Salford is facing hard times. Just a few years ago, its grant was cut by 40%. So how relevant is the CMU experiment? John Ashworth is the Vice-Chancellor of Salford. Oh, well, the, the experiment's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's the American system at its best, exactly what you would expect them to do. Set up an experiment, throw money at it, and, and accept that much of it's going to be wasted. Uh, in the UK, we've never quite gone about our business like that, even in the heyday, and in the universities, um, we are very, very short of money. So um, I have to say that it's inconceivable for us to do anything like that. So we need an IBM. Well, we, we need a godfather <clears throat> uh, or a government to give us the money, and at the moment we've got neither. Of course, IBM aren't being altogether altruistic about this, are they? In the oh, States? no. I mean, <laughs> the, the, it, it, it's fact, it was very clear, I think, from the programme that you filmed that there is still a lot to learn, and IBM very much want to know uh, some of the lessons that are going to come from Carnegie Mellon and, to be fair, other universities which are collaborating with, with other suppliers. And that's why they're doing experiments. I mean, they need a test bed, they need a demonstration centre. It's a good time to sit back, let them make the mistakes, and save ourselves a lot of money. Well, I think it's a... Oh, I'd love to do the experiment, of course. I mean, you know, I wish... I, I, I wish somebody would, uh, would give the University of Salford that kind of money. What we have been given is enough money to begin to make uh, some of the mistakes and learn some of the lessons, which are, I think, the really important ones. Now, it's, this is not to establish the technology, to work out how you make an IBM PC communicate with an Apple Macintosh or whether it's Unix or whatever. I mean, all that's the sort of technological problem. The, the educationally interesting problems are what you use the machine for and how do you present different kinds of educational task or training uh, uh, requirement to the student through this medium. Assuming a satisfactory outcome to the CMU experiment, how are computers going to affect the quality of our education? Let me say that the, in, in many ways, although it was tremendously exciting, all that technology at, at, at Carnegie Mellon, and immensely beguiling, 
um, there is a danger, and the danger that it's at is that it's actually too beguiling. I mean, you get so hung up with the technology, so intrigued by Andrew or Roger or whatever it is you want to call it, that you forget that it's actually a means to an end and not an end in itself. And the, the, the end is better education. Uh, I think the real act of faith, which you can see being tested in America, is that computers will enable us not only to give what we do presently better, but actually do new things. The, the, the act of faith is that there are skills which society needs, which these machines require and elicit from us, and which they themselves are um, the training agents. And if that's true, then who can say what kind of society that will give rise to? What do you think of art students having to learn high-level languages like Lisp? It seems to me perfectly natural, because the, the problem uh, of using uh, computers for educational purposes is not a technological one, in essence. It, it's a linguistic one. I mean, you're talking to a machine and using a machine to help you communicate uh, as opposed to talking to a person or using a translator to help you to communicate with somebody who speaks another language. So uh, I see that Lisp and Prolog are languages like Chinese or French or, or, or Spanish. And uh, it seems to be obvious, in fact, that the people who are most pre-adapted, if you like, to some of these activities will be art students. Let's move on to something else, sir. You mentioned that the government was being slightly mean there. Now, the government has claimed to be putting information technology very high on its list of priorities. Are they, in fact, ducking their responsibilities? Yes, I believe they are. I mean, I think that we have a clear skill shortage. They accept that. Uh, they've decided to spend £43 million pounds in increasing the provision at the university, predominantly at the university level, for uh, graduates and so on. But in fact, that £43 million pounds has come from other parts of the budget, so it's not, not, as far as the universities are concerned, new money. And, but even worse than that, they're not using that, that £43 million pounds in an experimental way. They're merely using it to replicate what we already do. Looking ahead a few years now, what will be the consequences of that lack of investment? We will not have the skilled people we need. Our service industries will find that they do not have access to the technologies they need. And by that I mean the banks and the financial system, the, the city. The city is already finding that it's having a great deal of difficulty recruiting the computer specialists it needs. And uh, at least at the moment, we are, according to the government, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, going to become a service-driven economy. Well, we're going to become an unproductive, non-technologically based service-driven economy, and that means a poor economy. So we're talking about a great deal more than just education here. Oh, yes, as always. I and mean, as the Americans uh, say, I mean, if you think education is, is expensive, uh, just try the alternative. Professor John Ashworth. And finally, from universities to the news that the British electronic publishing company, Datasolve, has signed an agreement with the Soviet news agency, TASS, to distribute its stories to terminals around the world. The signing on Tuesday in London is the first time the Soviets have ever consented to have their news distributed from a database. It means that from now on, subscribers to Datasolve will have rapid access to any TASS report, using D Datasolve's ability to search for any particular word or subject. In our next programme, we'll be looking at Prestel and asking whatever happened to the promise of armchair access to mass information. Eight years after its launch, it still only has about 60,000 members, and most of them are in business. Its critics say it's old technology poorly promoted. Next week, we discover why some of those promises have not been met and ask, have the French been leapfrogging ahead? Until next week, goodbye.